Hey guys, how's it going? In this video, we're going to go over what you need to know and what you need to be able to do for the rotational motion topic of the Advanced Tire Physics course. So let's get started. So remember, you can get access to this document that we're about to go through on my website. So check out the link in the description for that. And the first topic we're going to look at is kinematic relationships. So it says that you need to know that differential calculus notation is used to represent rate of change. So when you see things like ds by dt, that means the velocity, which is the rate of change of displacement. And when you see a equals dv by dt, that is the rate of change of velocity, which is acceleration. So that is your differential calculus notation there. Know that velocity is the rate of change of displacement with time, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time, and acceleration is the second differential of displacement with time. So remember those definitions are shown in the relationships, i.e. the equations that you use. You need to be able to derive the equations of motion, v equals u plus at and s equals ut plus a half at squared using calculus methods. It doesn't hurt to be able to derive the third one as well, just in case. You also need to be able to use calculus methods to calculate instantaneous displacement, velocity and acceleration for straight line motion with a constant or varying acceleration. So that will either be using differentiation or integration depending on what you're asked to find. It then says use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving displacement, velocity, acceleration and time for straight line motion with constant or varying acceleration. So you should be able to use all of these equations. So we've got v equals ds by dt, that's your velocity equals the rate of change of displacement. Acceleration a equals dv by dt, which equals d squared s by dt squared. So that is your acceleration equals the rate of change of velocity, which is the second differential of displacement. And v equals u plus at, your first equation of motion. s equals ut plus a half at squared, your second equation of motion. And v squared equals u squared plus 2as, your third equation of motion. So remember you saw these three equations at higher level, so you just need to be able to use them. Next, you need to know that the gradient of a curve or a straight line on a motion time graph represents instantaneous rate of change and can be found by differentiation. And then we have know that the gradient of a curve or a straight line on a displacement time graph is the instantaneous velocity and that the gradient of a curve or straight line on a velocity time graph is the instantaneous acceleration. You should also know that the area under a line on a graph can be found by integration. And this is particularly useful when the area is not a simple shape, like a rectangle or a triangle. So if it's a curved shape or a curved line, then you can find the area under it using integration. You also need to know that the area under an acceleration time graph between limits is the change in velocity and that the area under a velocity time graph between limits is the displacement. And lastly, for this first section, it says to determine displacement, velocity or acceleration by the calculation of the gradient of the line on a graph or the calculation of the area under the line between limits on a graph. Moving on to section two now for angular motion, you need to be able to use the radian as a measure of angular displacement. So all that's saying is you need to remember that angular displacement has the units of radians. You also need to be able to convert between degrees and radians and a useful way to remember this is that 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees or that pi radians is 180 degrees. Next it says to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving angular displacement, angular velocity, angular acceleration and time. So here we have angular forms of the linear forms of what we've just seen before in section 1 but here we have omega equals d theta by dt, which means that angular velocity is equal to the rate of change of angular displacement. We have that alpha equals d omega by dt, which equals d squared theta by dt squared. So remember that one means that angular acceleration is equal to the rate of change of angular velocity, which is equal to the second differential of the angular displacement. We then have our three equations of angular motion. We've got omega equals omega naught plus alpha t, theta equals omega naught t plus a half alpha t squared, and omega squared equals omega naught squared plus two alpha theta. All of those being analogous to the linear form. Forms. You also need to be able to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving angular and tangential motion. So remember when we've got an object or a particle sweeping out an arc length of s, then we get s equals r theta, and we've got v equals r omega for circular motion. This one relates linear velocity v to angular velocity omega. And then we've got the equation for tangential acceleration, which is at equals r alpha. And this one links the tangential or linear acceleration to the angular acceleration. Next we have use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving constant angular velocity, period, and frequency. So remember, if you know the period of your circular motion, then you can work out the angular velocity omega, or vice versa, if you know the angular velocity omega, you 
you can work out the period T. Or if we don't know the period at all and we know the frequency or the angular velocity, then we can use this equation here, omega equals 2 pi f. Next, you need to know that our centripetal, which is also known as a radial or a central force acting on an object, is necessary to maintain circular motion and results in centripetal, i.e. radial or central, acceleration of the object. So a centripetal force results in a centripetal acceleration. The two are related, remember. And the last outcome for section two, use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. So we have AR equals V squared over R, which equals R omega squared. So that was your centripetal or radial acceleration. And then we have the equation for radial or centripetal force, which is F equals MV squared over R, which equals MR omega squared. Lastly, we're going to look at section three on rotational dynamics. So in this topic, you need to know that an unbalanced torque causes a change in the angular or rotational motion of an object. Just like an unbalanced force causes a change in the linear motion of an object. Define moment of inertia of an object as a measure of its resistance to angular acceleration about a given axis. And that comes from the idea of inertia itself. And remember, inertia is just the resistance of an object to a change in its motion. You also need to know that moment of inertia depends on mass and the distribution of mass about a given axis of rotation. The next one is to use an appropriate relationship to calculate the moment of inertia for a point mass. So you need to be able to use I equals MR squared for a point mass. And then we have use an appropriate relationship to calculate the moment of inertia for discrete masses. So if you're trying to consider all the particles of mass, say, in a disk, then you would add them all up and you would get I equals the sum of MR squared. It then says to use appropriate relationships to calculate the moment of inertia for rods, disks, and spheres about given axes. Now remember, you do get these equations on the relationship sheet in the exam, so you don't have to memorize them, but you do need to be able to use them. So for a rod about the centre, it's I equals a half ml squared. Remember, L is just the length of the rod. For a rod about the end, it's I equals a third ml squared. For a disc about the centre, it's I equals a half mr squared, where r is the radius of the disc. And for a sphere about the centre, it's I equals two fifths mr squared. The next one is to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving torque, perpendicular force, distance from the axis, angular acceleration and moment of inertia. So that's T equals FR to find the torque in terms of the force and the distance from the axis of rotation. And that's T equals I alpha relating the torque or sometimes unbalanced torque to the angular acceleration. You also need to be able to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving angular momentum, angular velocity, moment of inertia, tangential velocity, mass, and its distance from the axis of rotation. So for a point mass, you should be able to use this relationship here, which is L equals MVR equals MR squared omega. So depending on whether you have the linear or tangential velocity V or the angular velocity omega will determine which one of these you use. And for a rigid body, you should be able to use this one L equals I omega. So so next we have to state the principle of conservation of angular momentum. Remember this is also known as the law of conservation of angular momentum. And this states that the angular momentum before an interaction is equal to the angular momentum after an interaction providing there are no external torques acting. You should also be able to use the principle of conservation of angular momentum to solve problems. So remember that involves putting in our symbols for angular momentum before equals angular momentum after in terms of I and omega. And lastly for section three, you need to be able to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving potential energy, rotational kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy, angular velocity, linear velocity, moment of inertia, and mass. So for rotational kinetic energy, we have EK rotational equals a half I omega squared. And of course, you should be able to use the linear form of kinetic energy or translational kinetic energy, which is EK equals a half MV squared. Remember also from National 5 and higher that gravitational potential energy EP is equal to MGH. So if you've got an object rolling down a hill, for example, you can say by conservation of energy that the gravitational potential energy at the top of the hill is going to be equal to the translational kinetic energy or the linear kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy of the object. And that is because the object is going to be linearly moving down the slope, but also rotating as it does so. That's all for this video, guys. I hope you found it useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.